Gentlemen, uh, Professor Costels, Chair of the Holberg uh, Prize Secretariat, uh, Professor Sigmund Grunwald, colleagues, warmly welcome to this guest <coughs> lecture. As a part of the Holberg Prize uh, 10th anniversary, the University of Nordland has been chosen as one of the universities in Norway where the earlier Holberg Prize, uh, Prize winners will hold a guest lecture. The Holberg Prize is awarded annually to scholars who have made outstanding contributions to research in the arts and humanities, social sciences, law and theology. So today we have the honor to host Professor Manuel Costelles, who got his prize in 2012. The Spanish uh, socialist uh, Manuel Costels is one of the world's most influential social scientists. In his research, Costels focuses on how the internationalization of the economy and uh, uh, digital media and communications technology affect cities, uh, cities, organizations, cultures and people around the world, linked together in the global network economy. Now I would like to give the floor to the chair of the Holberg Prize Secretariat, Professor Sigmund Grunmu at the University of Bergen. Thank you very much, Rector, Holberg Prize Laureate, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends. It is great to be here and the Professor Castells it is indeed a great pleasure to welcome you back to Norway uh, two years after you received the Ludwig Holberg Memorial Prize in Bergen. The Ludwig Holberg Memorial Prize was established by the Norwegian Parliament in 2003. The prize is administered by the University of Bergen on behalf of the Norwegian Ministry of Education and Research. The University of Bergen has appointed a board for the Ludwig Holberg Memorial Prize. Every year, the Ludwig Holberg Memorial Prize awards two prizes, the main Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize, both within the academic fields of uh, arts and humanities, social sciences, law and theology. The prizes are intended to raise the status of the fields of, um, uh, which are covered by the prizes and to increase society's awareness of the importance of research in these fields. The prizes are awarded by the board on behalf of the University of Bergen and on the recommendation of uh, academic committees which consist of outstanding scholars in the relevant academic fields. The formal award ceremony for the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize takes place in Håkonshallen in Bergen in June every year. Let me remind you that uh, in this year's prize ceremony on June the 4th, Professor Michael Cook from uh, Princeton University will receive the Holberg Prize and the Nils Klim Prize will be awarded to Professor Tarje Lundahl from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trumheim. The Holberg Prize is awarded to scholars who have made outstanding contributions to research in the arts and humanities, social sciences, theology or law, either within one discipline or through interdisciplinary work. The prize winner must have had a decisive influence on international research. The prize is worth 4.5 million Norwegian kroner, making it one of the most prestigious academic prizes in the world the equivalent in these fields to the Nobel Prize. This year we are celebrating the 10th anniversary of the Holberg Prize by inviting the previous laureates to come back to Norway to give public lectures at Norwegian universities. This Holberg lecture series started at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology last month and another lecture was given in Agder earlier this month. After the third lecture here today, the lecture series will continue in Stavanger in September and Bergen in November. I would like to extend our great gratitude to the University of Nuran, to Rector Paul Pedersen and his colleagues for organizing today's 
lecture by Manuel Castells. In 2012, Manuel Castells was the ninth scholar to receive the Holberg Prize. Then the academic committee stated that Manuel Castells is the leading sociologist of the city and new information and media technologies. His ideas and writings have shaped our understanding of the political dynamics of urban and global economies in the network society. He has illuminated the underlying power structures of uh, the society, of the great technological revolutions of our time and their consequences. He has helped us to understand how social and political movements have co-evolved with the new information technologies. Castell's uh, trilogy, The Information Age, offers a comprehensive theory of the global information-based society associated with urban networks and media communications. His theoretical insights are grounded in continuing, continuing empirical research into the societal and technological transformations associated with media power. His most recent work, Communication Power, is an innov innovative uh, analysis of the ways in which new media technologies can enable challenges to the concentration of media power, thus reconfiguring the political sphere. Today, Manuel Castells is the third Holberg Prize laureate to give the Holberg Lecture. The topic is, is social movements in the Internet age. Professor Castells, your floor is yours. Please welcome Manuel Castells. Good morning. Thanks for uh, coming to this event. Um, I'm very happy to be here. And um, I want for this to thank the University of Norland and uh, also the Holberg Foundation for the privilege of having some time exchanging ideas and findings of my last round of research with all of you here today. Um, I will concentrate in a topic that has been occupying me in the last years, actually, I had already started in 2012 um, to uh, work on the social movements, on the new wave of social movements in the world. And this, is, um, this was presented in a book that was published at the end of 2012, Networks of Outrage and Hope, a copy of which I just gave to your rector and will be in the library. Um, but I, I, uh, I, I have continued to work on this because I am running after my subject. Uh, the more I work on the social movements uh, that have happened in the world, and the more these movements develop and explode. Uh, the latest round uh, last year in Turkey, in Brazil, uh, in a very complicated way at the same time, but it's also significant in Ukraine uh, with all the developments. In other words, uh, we are uh, witnessing in the last five years the explosion around the world of the social movements of our age, which as all social movements take different forms, uh, different shapes, and with different outcomes depending on the institutional, cultural, and historical concept. Uh, please, no picture during the lecture. Um, because it just blows me up. Thank you. Um, so for this, I will uh, remind you that throughout history, uh, social movements have always been the levers of social change. Uh, they are the uh, collective actions that regardless of their outcome and of the content of the social change, they are those that uh, actually transform the existing power relations and the existing cultural values in societies. This is not normative. I'm not saying they are good or bad. They can be terrible, actually, in terms of, of human values. But they're important. And therefore, as social scientists, we have to be agnostic in terms of their outcomes, but very rigorous and serious in terms of considering their specificity, their processes of formation, and how they ultimately uh, change society by changing particularly the minds of the people. The institutional change 
power relationships change as a consequence of the change in the minds of the people. And therefore, as social science really connects the, uh, the interaction between people's minds and the institutions of society, uh, social movements are a fundamental part of the study of the society's transformation. In all cases in history, social movements are triggered by emotions, not by programs, not by political projects, not by a rational decision, but emotions. And these emotions are shared collectively from individual to individual through a process of communication. Being leaflets, preaches in the churches or in the mosque, uh, or pamphlets, radio programs, television programs, and lately, of course, by our new forms of communication based on uh, internet-based networks, both uh, in traditional forms and in the mobile platforms of communication. So in, to some extent, social movements throughout history and today, uh, they are affected uh, by the forms of communication, organization, and action of the movements that depend on the interaction between cultural culture, technology, and the institutional environment of the time and the space of communication. So that's what I will try to show. Not that the social movements are created by the internet. That's not even su such a ridiculous argument that I will not stop there. Uh, we can discuss it later if you want, but it's not the issue. The issue is all social movements are triggered by emotions linked to a fear uh, to the feeling of injustice, of a situation that people cannot tolerate anymore, and they mobilize and they explode. So uh, injustice, oppression, discrimination, in terms of class, race, ethnicity, gender, and nationality, these are the source of social movements. But from misery, from oppression, don't necessarily rise social movements. Most of the history of the world is in terms of silent silence, suffering, taking it because there's no other way to revolt until one day it, there is a revolt. And so that's what I'm trying to, to understand. The moments in which this spark or revolt happen, how this spark fires the prairie, and how these processes lead to different transformations from the cultural level, from the personal level, to the institutional level. And this is a process that is endless, uh, except that there are some moments in history in which are particularly intense moments of change. And these moments of change spread in our world, in addition, through the logic of virality, which characterizes the internet. So the point is that, as, as we will see in a moment, these movements uh, even if they are by no means produced or uh, developed because new technologies, uh, but these new technologies shape movements and create forms of mobilization uh, which, were extreme, which are extremely different from the traditional forms in history and therefore uh, with different outcomes, different processes and different actors, different actors. For instance, the, the not necessarily uh, uh, mandatory uh, form of uh, organized leadership. There are new forms of organization. So this is what I will try to convey to you um, through my observation, direct and indirect, on many of these movements in the world. But let me first uh, go quickly to um, remind you some of these uh, of these movements. What, 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 what are we talking about? Um, in fact, in, if I take 2009 as a starting year. There are many others already uh, linked to new forms of communication in the 2000s. But uh, starting in, in Iran, of all places, in July 2009, uh, there had been a series of uh, social movements in, in the world that then they continued in, in late um, uh, 2010 um, in Iceland and Tunisia 
two completely different cultures, countries at the opposite the spectrum of the planet, and both the same year, both exploded, and both led to a sort of a revolution, even in institutional terms. Um, from then on, this new wave of social movement has uh, affected thousands of cities in over 100 countries in the world, with uh, tens of millions of people participating in it. And um, in many of these countries, not in all, but in most countries, in fact, uh, with widespread support in the public opinion. Um, so to, the, to this point, when people say, well, why not in everywhere in the world? Well, because there are institutional conditions and because not necessarily the, the, the causes of this indignation uh, are the, the same or equally justified. Uh, so it's not by definition that this will happen or has happened and will happen in the future in every country. But in any case, uh, wherever and, uh, there is a surge of uh, strong protest and indignation, uh, it will happen in the form that uh, these movements have taken place. Um, so I contend that many of these uh, movements present similar characteristics that form a pattern of collective action that in spite of the huge cultural differences and the huge institutional difference is common, and that's what I will try to show. And my point is very simple, methodologically speaking. If from completely different contexts there is a common pattern, we have a new actor in history, precisely. Um, then with a specificity linked to each context, but with a fundamental nucleus of common characteristics, which is what I will try to explain in the lecture. One immediate thing, remember when I say disparity of context, means that these movements in the world are not necessarily related to economic crisis. Yes, in Europe, yes, in the United States, but not everywhere in the world. Brazil, high growth economy, um, and actually a relatively stable democracy, in, uh, left wing go government, uh, the, 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 the Workers' Party in government, uh, with a very progressive uh, president, Dilma Rousseff. Um, or Turkey, moderate Islamism, but growing at 7% per year, reducing inequality, reducing poverty. Okay? So we, we cannot say, yes, it's the economic crisis. Uh -uh. In some cases, it's the economic crisis, in many cases. In other cases, it's, uh, uh, it's something else. There's something else varies upon countries. Uh, in the case of Brazil, it's a critique of the model of economic growth. So they are not criticizing that they don't grow. They are criticizing the way they grow and the consequences ecologically human. In all the countries, there is one common theme, and that's important. The political institutions. Democracy as it is practiced is not recognized by any of these movements. They always challenge the way in which the demands of the society are processed in the political system. One common word, but I don't think it's entirely uh, correct in all the cases, but is the common word of the movements, corruption. In every moment, in every country, they blame the, the lack of responsiveness to citizens by the word corruption, which doesn't necessarily mean bribes to the politicians, etc. It means they are not representing us. They represent the money and their personal interests. Uh, in the case of the United States, for instance, it's not necessarily they think that uh, um, Bush or Obama receive money uh, in their pocket. No. But the observation, which is empirically proven, is that politics dominates, is dominated by money in the United States with the blessing of the United States Supreme Court. Everything depends on how money you have in the campaign, and that depends on who are your donors and how much these donors uh, railroad either the Republicans or the Democrats. An interesting case, if you want to know, uh, Murdoch systematically uh, has provided, uh, through his media empire in the United States, uh, has provided 
um, the ideological support, meaning news, to the Republicans, I mean, the war in Iraq, etc., and money to the Democrats. So <laughs> whoever wins, uh, it's always in, in, in good connection with the Murdoch empire. Let me just go quickly in, in, the, in this list of some of these movements. Starting to, in, in, in Tehran in July 2009, the 2010, the kitchenware revolution in Iceland. And then the Arab revolts that started in Tunisia in December 2010 and spread to Egypt and to most Arab countries in the spring, famous Arab spring of 2011. Again, with all kind of damaging consequences. So I'm not connecting about that. But results and impact, absolutely. Greece, in 2010 and until now, the major indignadas movement in Spain, I say in, in feminine because that's how the movement calls itself. Um, the indignadas movement in Spain started in May 2011 and is still very active. These days is extremely active with all kinds of demonstrations, intervening now in the electoral campaign, etc. Occupy Wall Street in the United States launching on September 17, 2011, and expanding in the following months in the United States with various intensities to over 1,000 cities in the United States. You have the map in my book of the, all the occupations in the United States, supposedly the country where uh, this kind of movement would not happen. Well, over 1,000 cities had occupation for at least several months or several weeks. Um, the largest mobilization in the history of Israel in 2011 uh, with the tent city and demonstration of 500,000 people uh, in, in such a small country. Um, even in Russia, in Moscow in 2012, uh, major demonstrations against Putin authoritarianism. Uh, Portugal against the economic crisis, still going on. The socio-political movement, which was not exactly the same kind of social movement, but it was based on the net entirely of Cinque Stelle uh, in Italy and uh, Beppe Grillo, who has become the second largest, if not the first, political force in Italian politics these days, starting from zero. Um, or the student movement in Chile since um, 2011, which has been in the streets of Santiago until today. Uh, in Mexico, the Yo Soy El 132, I am the 132nd. Um, which uh, has been increasingly important, and again, what people say it had not disappeared at all. I was in Guadalajara with them uh, last November. They're extremely active and doing all kinds of things beyond the media. Um, and then uh, major movements uh, in 2013, the Turkish protest for the defense of Gezi Park in Istanbul, then spreading to um, Turkish cities, and the massive youth demonstrations uh, in dozens of Brazilian cities in, 19, uh, in 2013 against transportation fares, um, urban services, but mainly against political corruption in June and September 2013 and now preparing for the World Cup. Can you imagine the Brazilians protesting the World Cup in Brazil? Uh, is that a cultural revolution or what? Um, uh, and the slogan is very simple. We exchange one good hospital for ten stadiums. That's what they are saying. Not that they don't like football. Of course they will support the Brazilian national team. But they are saying, what about the rest? What about this corruption of the FIFA? They consider FIFA the most corrupted uh, institution in the world. And the Brazilian government, and, and particularly the local and state governments uh, connected to the FIFA. And the huge corruption that has surrounded the construction uh, going on in Brazil, as it was in South Africa uh, four years ago. So, you see, th therefore the arguments of these movements are very different in every case, but they all coincide in which we citizens don't have a say on all these things that happen beyond our control. This is not a democracy. This is corruption in the sense that I try to, uh, to mention. And then later, um, the um, Maidan occupation uh, for months and um, squares and public buildings against Yanukovych in Ukraine with all the consequences that follow. We can go into the details of that later on if, if you want. In all the movements, besides the, the common theme of um, the um, attack to the political system and corruption and the denunciation of the 
uh, the fact that, as they say, they do not represent us, meaning the politicians. Uh, which, by the way, coincides with the public opinion polls around the world, in which overall in the planet, about 70% of people feel they are not represented by the political representatives, including the United States and Europe. But besides that, there is one word. You know, students of social movements, we have to take social movements seriously as themselves. <clears throat> we have to define social movements by starting from the point of how they define themselves, rather than saying they should say this and not that, which is what many uh, ideologues, but also some scholars, say about social movements. The notion of false consciousness is a very dangerous notion. The false concept is, I know the concept that you should have, and if you don't have it, what you have is false. Wait, wait a second. Uh, you have to start from what people uh, say and what they are, and you know what they are in terms of what they say, because that's how they connect to other people. If they say different things, then the other people will not connect. So that, that's the critical point. If, if, you, if you start a movement for the defense of cats, you are a cat, but you say, let's unite dogs of the world. Well, then the dogs will come, not the cats. So the, the point is what the movements say, what they actually say, is what defines the movement. So what the movements say everywhere, the same word is interesting, the same word, literally translated in every language. What is this word? Anyone has a wild guess? It's the same word. Dignity. Dignity. Is that interesting? Even in Ukraine, it started as dignity. But dignity in Brazil, dignity in Spain, in Dignados, uh, dignity in, in the Occupy Wall Street, and dignity, of course, in the Arab revolt, that the word dignity was repeated again and again and again. Dignity. Which, interesting enough, is, uh, coincides with the definition that Amartya sends Amartya Sen gives about development. That development is not about more or less health, more or less, it's about dignity. And of course, dignity includes human rights, includes education, includes everything, but something more fundamental for people than anything. Dignity because if I'm not considered as a dignified person, as a human, with rights as a human, if I don't, I'm not recognized with dignity, I'm nothing. And that's how people are reacting these days against the political institutions. They do not recognize me. I don't exist unless I, I vote in certain ways, I buy, I, I consume. I'm nothing if I'm not considered by others. I'm not being myself. And therefore, my main claim is for dignity. That's what the movement say everywhere. Then we can interpret it in different ways. We can say that they are idealistic, that they don't understand, the, 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 the function of the market, that they don't understand the, the complexity of democracy. We can say all that. But what they say is dignity. Right? So, how, what, when I say there is an emerging pattern, what is this emerging pattern which tends to reproduce everywhere without connection, without organization, simply through virality in the internet, but virality in the internet means that, that people already are inclined to develop a similar form of organization which uh, ultimately uh, translates into um, their a similar practice. First of all, they are network in multiple forms. They are certainly network in the internet and mobile uh, networks of communication which is one of the reasons our societies are different. Because when we say, well, yes, but not everybody's network, not everybody's network, we have at this point in the planet seven billion numbers of mobile devices. Not devices, not machines, numbers, subscribers, seven billion in a planet of 7.6. If you take out uh, children under three, Say under three, because under five, they start having some phones. Uh, uh, it's practically, we are all connected. Uh, and therefore, one of the things is that you, what used to be 
forms of indirect communication and forms of direct communication. And of this, uh, the, the current projection for three years from now is that of these seven billion um, uh, numbers, five billion are smartphones. Five billion. So, uh, good or bad, this is our planet, completely interconnected. Okay? Now, communication has always been central in social movements, always. But internet and mobile platforms provide the capacity for autonomous communication uncontrolled by media corporations. Internet corporations is different. By traditional media corporations, the one too many message from television, radio, and largely by passing government controls. Largely by passing, meaning not surveillance. Everybody is surveilled. Sure, you are, I am, everybody. But surveillance and control is not the same thing. Meaning that they know everything bad we do. Uh, but even if they know, they cannot stop it if we connect to others. So that, that's the difference, you see? The, the control is you stop the flow. Now the flow cannot be stopped. Egypt tried to do it in five days and surrender for reasons that I, we can discuss if, if you want. But now, this networking is multimodal. It includes social networks which are pre-existing in society. So in other words, social networks, face-to-face, -face, um, neighborhood-based networks, uh, work-based networks, football fans, clubs networks, very important in the Egyptian revolution and in the other Arab revolutions. All these are pre-existing networks face-to-face, -face, that then they connect also from the Internet. So the micro-networks connect, become macro-networks by connecting through the Internet and mobile phones. Um, but at the same time, the, um, these networks are also urban networks, are spatially based networks. So in other words, the multimodality is in the Internet, is in mobile phones, Internet it's also mobile phones at the same time, but there are mobile phones which are not internet. There are social networks, they are networks of communication in, in the cities, and there are networks that are based in the space. Um, one of the key elements of this, uh, the key consequences of this network logic is that they can afford not to have an identifiable center and yet ensure coordination functions, deliberation, by interaction between multiple nodes. Therefore, they do not need a formal leadership. They do not need a command and control center or a vertical organization to distribute information or instructions. And some people say it's a weakness, but any, first, that's how they are. Now, it doesn't mean that sometimes there cannot be personal leaders. In Chile, for instance, there's personalized leadership. But this is not the movement. The personalized leadership is more spoke persons for the movement than the coordinating function. And there is no formal organization in none of these movements around the world. And in the entire world, there is no one single case of a formal organization in which uh, there is a program, there, there are a cadre, there is a complete transformation of which are the uh, traditional forms of social mobilization. Um, however, it's not simply that they are ephemeral, they are spontaneous. These networks continue to exist. These networks continue to develop. And when they don't exist in the streets, they exist in the Internet, always. They, they are constantly reconfigured, but they don't stop existing. In other words, it's a variable geometry of an organization, but the organization is not formal, it has a network form of organization. Now, this certainly ma maximizes chances of participation in the movement because these are open-ended networks without boundaries that they change according to the level of invol involvement of the population at large. It also reduces the vulnerability of the movement to a threat of repression. 
Um, repression usually focuses on the occupied sites, on the physical space. But in, 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 in terms of the internet, it's very difficult to really repress the movement. They can repress certain people, but how you disconnect a whole network that uh, evolves constantly. Moreover, networking protects the movement against its adversaries, but also against its own internal dangers of bureaucratization and manipulation by leaders. Uh, as a veteran of the May 68 movement in Paris, um, I can tell you that one of the worst moments in, in the May 68 movement were that in the general assemblies, uh, there were always people who would try to impose their ideology for hours and would exhaust the movement, and people would just give up uh, any revolution to stop the torture of being lectured again and again by the same ideologues. Well, in these networks, when an ideologue starts being really heavy, you just disconnect the guy and, and, and go on uh, and, and reconfigure the network and, and forget about the, 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 the um, prehistoric left. Um, but while this movement starts usually on the internet social networks, usually and almost always, they become a movement, visible movement, by occupying urban space. It's also systematic. It's not they don't stay in the internet. If they stay in the internet, they don't become a movement challenging the institution of society. They become visible by occupying urban space. Why? Because since there is a complete closing of the institutional space as a way to access to, the, to influence society, then the only way to exist beyond the internet networks is occupying the space in different forms, uh, establishing tents and, and, and then going on for weeks or months, or demonstrations in the street. In, in, in Brazil, for instance, were mainly demonstrations in the street, but again and again and again for weeks. Um, now, occupying urban space doesn't guarantee that you have a powerful social movement. Uh, in some cases, uh, some very sad cases, to, to name names, Amsterdam, for instance, is a very sad social movement, uh, which they, they occupied Amsterdam for months, and they became almost like a tourist attraction, uh, but no impact on the, on the Dutch society for a number of circumstances. Or even a movement that I participate myself marginally, but I did, uh, in the London, and occupy London, they were in the steps of St. Paul's Cathedral for, for months, but with not great success in, in attracting much people. They were more active in the internet, but was really not, uh, they were not able to catch on, on this. Uh, we can discuss why in the UK these types of movements have not been so uh, influential than in other parts, mainly because of the strength of the public union sectors, which have uh, led uh, much, much of the protest through traditional channels of, of protest. But the critical thing is the connection between cyberspace and the urban space. That is what uh, is the distinctive feature of these new social movements. Uh, because they create a space, which I call a new form of space, the space of autonomy, which is made of cyberspace and urban space. This space of autonomy is fundamental, as in any major process of transformation, because when movements do not have a foot into the institutions of society, when they do not have direct political expression or they do not have uh, the possibility to impose other sorts of power relationships, then they have, in order to deliberate, in order to exchange ideas and proposals among the people in the movement, they need first to step out of the institution of society and create an autonomous space of existence and communication as a new social actor. All over history, this, this autonomous spaces had been fundamental, and they always had a space of expression. The famous history in any revolution of the barricades. The barricades were never a military instrument to defend against artillery and, and, and and the, the charges of the cavalry, never. On the contrary, they become a target. If, if everybody goes into the barricade, you crash them in the barricades. That is much easier. 
but they have a very important effect, a symbolic effect, the in and out. You are in the movement, you are with us in the barricades. And then here we are, we are all together. There is no party, there is no ideology, we are all together, both in an instant community of practice and facing the danger together. And that's very important because the most, going into the emotional part of the analysis, the most potent emotion in human nature has been identified by neuroscientists is fear, fear, the most potent one. Uh, fear drives society. Uh, we live in fear. Fear of being excluded, fear of being repressed, fear of losing our job, fear of being beaten, fear of going to jail, fear of everything. Civilization is based on fear. And therefore, the most important uh, human mechanism to overcome is to overcome fear if you want to change something. This overcoming of fear happens through a process of sharing, of togetherness. If I fear, but I have your hand and you have my hand, together we can. Uh, isolation and fear goes together. Overcoming of fear and creation of hope is about sharing and togetherness. And this togetherness is not today by going to a meeting of a political party or having a, a membership card of a trade union. This, as is always happened in history, this togetherness goes through material processes that can be identifiable but everybody participating in the process as we are together here, even if we don't think the same way, even if we don't have different ideologies. But in this particular fight, we are together. That happens only in the space of autonomy that is created. And in our time, this space of autonomy is combined of cyberspace and urban space in constant interaction. Movements are also local and global at the same time. They are always local because they always explode in one particular place, in, in grievances linked to a particular society, etc. But they are immediately connected globally through the internet. And every movement knows exactly what's going on somewhere else. And they take hope and they take uh, lessons from the others and they constantly exchange information and emotion. Um, and in, in many cases, the movement had developed viral as a result of what happened in another country. Absolutely clear in the case of the uh, Arab revolutions. Um, Egypt had been revolting against Mubarak for decades, always being crushed through extreme violence supported by the United States. At the same time, um, when Tunisia happened, and from one moment of indignation because of the suicide of a street vendor went to transform the, the Tunisian movement uh, and then the society, the Egyptian revolt started when a young woman placed a, in her Facebook page a call uh, in January 2011 saying that she was going to demonstrate by herself uh, in the middle of Tahrir Square and she added with a little irony that, that some people did not perceive, we, the poor women of Egypt, we need your help, man. You are strong. Please come to help me when I go to Tahrir Square by myself to be beaten. Uh, so playing, you know, the sexist patriarchal feeling in Egypt the other way around. And that's how it started. But it started because of Tunisia. Because what the messages that were posted were saying, if Tunisian people can, we can. And the main slogan in the first demonstration on January 26 was um, Tunisia is the solution. And that's relevant because the traditional slogan of the Islamists had been Islam is the solution. And the movement started as Tunisia is the solution, meaning let's go all together, religious and non-religious, uh, for democracy and against the dictatorship, etc., etc. Um, so they are local and global at the same time, and they intertwine the issues and problems of their society with the problems of humanity at large, explicitly and everywhere. So they are at the same time a culturally cosmopolitan and culturally in terms of local national identity, both at the same time. 
they are largely spontaneous in their action, meaning no one organizes it. Nowhere. And they are usually triggered by a spark of indignation that can be of different kind. Police brutality is often the case. Blatant corruption is often the case. Uh, in uh, Brazil in September uh, 2013, when the movement was starting to go down, something new happened on the day of the Brazilian uh, independence. Uh, one of the deputies in the national parliament that had been sentenced to jail, convicted of stealing public funds for years. Uh, from his jail, he protested and asked the, 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 the parliament to vote on it. They were, oh, all right, all right, I'm a crook, I'm in jail, but what about my salary as a member of parliament? Uh, please keep it. Well, the, the, the Congress voted to keep his salary. <laughs> So that created such an explosion of indignation that people went back to the streets, you see. So it's always this moment of a spark of indignation of something particular that, that has happened. In this case, the power of images is paramount. YouTube has been the most important factor of all the networks because of images, particularly images of police brutality are, uh, feed all the time the spark of indignation. Movements are viral seeing and listening to protests somewhere else, even in distinct contexts and distinct cultures, inspires mobilization for one reason. It triggers hope. If they can do it, we can do it. It's another emotion. And a key emotion, fear and hope, are the two key emotions, negative and positive. And the transition from outrage to hope, which explains the title of my book, Networks of Outrage and Hope, um, is accomplished by deliberation large-scale deliberation in the space of autonomy. These are also highly self-reflective movements. They don't have a program. They don't have an ideology. They don't have anything except the indignation and the will to search together for ways out of this mess in which humankind is at this point and in their particular society. So they, they think together all the time. They talk together all the time. They are usually quite educated people. Um, they are usually college educated, usually unemployed at the same time, or underemployed. Certainly this is the, the case in, in Spain. Uh, because they are highly educated, they, they try to elaborate new things. They don't believe in ideology. They don't believe in traditional parties. Uh, Marx is yes, why not? The, they more would be anarchists than Marxists, in fact, but not even anarchists. They are so anarchists that they don't believe in anarchism. So, uh, <laughs> but for instance, I have, a, I have a, one of the assemblies I attended in Barcelona. Um, they spent two hours discussing about Heidegger, Heidegger, uh, in a social movement. I personally did not understand the connection, but they were very passionate about yes or no if Heidegger could be a guide and someone say, well, wait a second, but he was pro-Nazi. Well, no, the concepts are not pro-Nazi, so, uh, so that kind of, of, of discussion, very uh, self-reflective. Now, critical point, in their origin, the, in, their, in their origin, they are never violent movements. They're always explicitly non-violent. And the way in which the institutional system everywhere has tried to destroy the movement is through violence. In a one immediate way, you just kill, disband the movement by uh, utmost, utmost violence. Uh, the, the notion that through repression you deal with that. But even when violence does not succeed in disbanding the movement, changes the nature of the movement. If the movement ultimately responds with violence, it's a different kind of movement. And it depends on the scale of the violence. Of course, the most dramatic case is the Arab revolutions, in which at one point, um, if the violence reaches the point in which you trigger a civil war, civil wars, in, this, in any civil war, social movements are the first victim. Because that is a different matter. It's who has more guns, 
who has more determination to kill the other, and then there's a self-destructive spiral. Uh, and some of these cases, so very democratic, peaceful social movements become uh, subjects to such a level of violence that becomes civil war, and as soon as there is civil war, the old powers, the geopolitical powers, the sectarian powers, come in and make a human catastrophe. The most blatant case, of course, is Syria, in which for six months, I followed very closely the Syrian movement, I was not in Syria, but my main research collaborator uh, is a Syrian-American who was there, and a journalist from Al Jazeera, and, and was documenting every step. For the first six months, there was an absolutely peaceful movement triggered by indignation of the uh, brutal repression against children. Uh, they, they, uh, they sent to, to jail uh, 14 children, 12, 13 years old, who had been writing graffiti against Assad and the walls, and they would torture them, some of them to death. Uh, and then when the parents went to protest and claim their children, they killed the parents. And that was all on YouTube, and that prompted a massive movement all over Syria. For six months, they protested peacefully, absolutely peacefully. More than 10,000 people were killed in these demonstrations. And at one point, some people started to take guns, few guns. They were not prepared for that. But as soon as they did that, uh -huh, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Jordan came in, uh, with the notion that the most important fight for them is, of course, not against uh, the United States, but against the uh, Shiites. The Sunni-Shiite split is one of the most violent in the world. Uh, and then, of course, at that point, uh, the United States uh, said, well, okay, let, let's try to see if we can get rid of Assad. And Israel was not too unhappy with the idea. And then, of course, at the same time, then Russia said, wait a second, I have my only naval base outside Russia in Syria, uh, let's support Assad. And at that point, Iran said, okay, uh, well, uh, Assad is very important, so Hezbollah, go back and go to Syria and defend the interests of the Shiite, and then call to Pe Beijing, and Beijing said, aha, my main source of oil is Iran, so no, no, in the United Nations, we are going to block any intervention. And you understand how you go from a peaceful, democratic movement to transform Syria into a major geopolitical um, involvement that ultimately ends up in human misery. So that's why we, we always have to recognize the importance of the movement and be unfortunately agnostic about um, their ultimate um, impact. So the thorny question of violence is not simply a static matter. It is the life and death of the social movements. How these social movements are able to manage violence, you always have in all the movements at one point appear something called the black bloc. The black bloc supposedly started in the anti-globalization movement, uh, particularly in Italy, um, as an ultra-anarchist radical group that thinks that the, the system has to be brought down by violence in no other way. Uh, let's not be naive. We, read, we need to attack the system. Um, now, I, after having looked carefully, I call the, the black block the black box uh, because everything is there. There, are, yes, there are a few ultra radical anarchists. They are youth from uh, actually the marginal uh, groups of society, overexploited and uh, marginalized, who are enraged. Uh, they are hooligans, uh, and they are police-led provocators. All these at the same time. And, of course, these become the, the image, the public image of the movement in the majority of the society through television becomes a violent movement because these are, as you know, television only records the most violent images. Uh, they are not going to, to show... Uh, one hour of interesting, peaceful debate about what, what to do with the capitalist society. Uh, they are going to show two minutes of extreme violence uh, in the streets. Uh, so how movements um, relate to violence becomes extremely important. The movements are rarely, rarely programmatic movements. They don't have a program. They cannot have a program. 
they're spontaneous, they come together, and their idea is to elaborate the program through a long process of in, in, interaction and, and, and joint deliberation, etc., etc. In some cases, they, and the notion that the General Assemblies decide everything, which is a, since they don't trust any uh, form of organization because we can, they, their main thing is to criticize the delegation of power, the delegation of representation, therefore they have to do everything by assembly. And therefore, uh, the program also would be assembly. The Occupy Wall Street ended up having a program. But it's not what I call a program. There were 347 different demands, including the withdrawal of all American forces from around the world. Uh, so, um, this was so not a program. It was a, a, a wish list of every possible thing, because everybody with a, a, a vote would add, uh, and me too, I, I, now I want this, and, and the whales, by the way, and, and uh, everything. Um, so they don't have a program, uh, usually. They may have, in some cases they do, specific demands. And when they have a specific demands, uh, these demands are usually uh, uh, conquered in the struggle of the movement. When the demand is focused, some, in some cases it's very easy, it's a dictator, Mubarak, okay? So you focus on destroying the dictatorship of Mubarak and there all the movement agrees. So that's an objective rather than a program. And some, in some cases in the Spanish movement, the, the whole notion was to transform the mortgage law that is one of the most unfair in the world, and they won. They stopped the mortgage law, they stopped the... the the, the evictions that were evicting 400,000 people in Spain. Uh, so the, there are some elements of, of this, but as a program, meaning an elaborate ideology with a program, they don't have it. And why not? Because as one of the slogans of the Spanish movement says, we are slow because we go far. So it's a long historical, it's an interesting, there's a consciousness in this movement of the time, the historic time of their sequence. They don't want to seize power immediately because they don't trust seizing power. They don't trust themselves about seizing power. Uh, it would be horrible. And someone told me, imagine if, uh, if we would seize power now, uh, we, we would do horrible things to, to ourselves and to our people, which is actually the history of revolutions. They seize power and then they, the first ones they, they kill or torture are the most revolutionary ones who, who don't concede uh, to, to stop at that level. And in that sense, and they don't care too much, and now it's changing, but they, they, are, they don't care too much about the political system, the transformation in the short term, meaning elections, etc. They aim basically at changing the values of society, hoping that these values of society will ultimately permeate in the political institutions. But they are political in a very fundamental sense, in their utopia of a new form of democracy in a network democracy, in which uh, all the institutions will be networked between assemblies and internet and, and, and different forms of, of, uh, of democracy uh, in a purely utopian sense. Now, we have come to be used to the notion that utopia means senseless, nothing. You know, we should take seriously utopias if we look at history because utopias are blueprints in the minds of the people about how they would like to live and govern and self-govern. And all the major political ideologies and construction history come from utopias. Uh, liberalism was a utopia. The u liberal utopia. Socialism was a utopia. Anarchy was a utopia. Communism was a utopia. And then some incarnating monsters, another incarnating mild forms of but the, everything that we live by has been constructed in the world of ideas and then incarnated in different historical processes depending on the power relationships. Then in concluding, let me address what I call the so what question, um, which is what particularly politicians and media and journalists, journalists need headline for tomorrow, not actually for today. Um, so then, yeah, 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 all this is very nice, cute, interesting, good people, uh, nice kids. But then, then they, they're going to do what? What is the result? What is the change? 
So here's what is the change. Um, first of all, the, um, in terms, there are different levels uh, of, of answer to this question, and I will try to summarize quickly. Um, in terms of the more deep question about how you understand the outcomes of social movements, there is a debate in the movement uh, in which the predominant attitude is what the rejection of what they call the productivist notion of the movement, measuring in terms of productivity what for them they are dreams, they are hopes, they are, there is a, a, a work in progress, a process of construction. So what is this rush to immediately measure in terms of outputs what we are doing, we are doing with our lives, so we want to decide what is the output, not to have to deliver a product according to a contract with the municipality. Uh, so that, that's what most of the thing on the movement. We'll, we'll see what happens. For the moment, what is clear is what we don't want, and, and we are not going to stop until something else emerges, and if something else emerges, has its time and logic depending on the time the, and depending on the country, on the culture, on the institutional country. My own, let's say, more theoretical question based on history, it's, um, it's, a, diff it's a different one, is that I have a romantic theory of social movements, uh, looking at history. Social movements always disappear, uh, always. They always fade away. They are either killed, repressed, co-opted, disintegrated, uh, denied, uh, so the issue is not so much if the movement as such survives, but which are the consequences of the movement in the process of fading away. Uh, maybe simply extermination of the movement and some ideas that remain in people's minds, or maybe it's a series of reforms that transform the institutions that exist, or maybe it's completely new institutions. The French Revolution was a completely new institutional system. Unfortunately, the Soviet Revolution was also a completely new institutional system, right? Uh, and, but so, and then of course, both in the French Revolution and the Soviet Revolution, immediately the social movement were exterminated by the victors. But different processes lead to different moments and so the importance of social movements can never be measured in advance. It's, it's the uh, verdict of history of what happens then later with, with the social movement. So they're always important, but the, in terms of the, pro, the outcome of the movement, it's something that uh, varies, but with one invariant. The movement as such always fades away. So it means that why so much effort, so, so much human suffering for that? Well, no, because, because that my romantic image is like the waves of your ocean eroding over centuries and millennia the shores and transforming the nature and transforming the life through this relentless uh, movement of the waves and of the wind, etc. So this is what social movements do. They shape society. They transform institutions. They transform people's minds. But it takes a historic time, although sometimes it accelerates. Let me just refer to two movements that everybody agrees that they have transformed the cultures of the world in the last 40 years. The women's movement. The women's movement. 40 years ago, the way in which the women's consciousness, the council of women about themselves was, is radically different from what it is today throughout the world. And most of you women students here would not even recognize yourself in your grandmothers. Uh, grandmothers were heroic, but could not, had to shut up, basically, uh, by and large. Uh, so it's not that feminists is modern. The witches were the feminists of the time, and they, that's why they were burned. Uh, but the, the issue of uh, the transformation of women's culture is now widely recognized, and that came from the women movement in the 1960s and 70s, and then went on. Um, or the environmental movement. In the first Earth Day in, uh, in 1970, the notion of 
defending nature was actually decried by uh, communists and, and um, radical left parties all over the world as a plot to favor capitalists, because the nature was not important. Productive forces and the distribution of wealth by the proletariat was the important thing. That was a capitalist plot. Well, today, every major political force in the world has to paint itself in green, somewhat, uh, uh, to, to be credible. Uh, this has been, and this I studied in my other book, Communication Power, how the environmental movement transformed, with the help of journalists, by the way, and then later on on the internet, transformed the environmental continent, which is now a new concept. So there are fundamental changes, but they take different avenues and different ways, and we are at the beginning of a different uh, process of change, which refers essentially to the transformation of the political institutions. Well, then more empirical things. The ultimate battle for social change is in fact decided in the minds of the people, how people think. How people think will determine what people do eventually. And there is no example in history for, uh, that if for a long, long time institutions can go one way and the people's minds go another way. And this is what's happening in the world today, by and large. Institutions go one particular way with the interest group, money controlling politics, etc., and people's minds go another way. Uh -uh. This cannot go for a long time in this way. And in that sense, the movement has been decisive in changing people's minds. How we know that? First, by opinion polls, as primitive as they are as instruments of measure, but um, we, we know throughout the world the large majority of countries support the movement, or in the case of the United States, for instance, more people agree with Occupy than um, they disagree with Occupy. And, and then in the middle is the 40% are indifferent, and then the more people uh, support than others. Now, but has then Occupy World State in the United States have no consequence? Well, the United States always thought about itself in general as a non-class society. The issue of class was non-existent. Now, the 99% notion is there in the public discourse, everywhere politicians, media, etc. In the long-term opinion poll series in the 1960s is the first time in the history of the United States in which people think, 67% of people think that the most important conflict in the US is between rich and poor. I would call it class struggle, right? Um, first time. Then, you know what is the number one book sale in Amazon US at this point? Thomas Piketty, the book on inequality by a French economist, uh, who, yes, in France with immediate, immediate hit, but in the United States is number one bestseller, and which is really a book about denouncing the structural tendency of capitalism toward the concentration of wealth and income and assets at the same time. Well, it's a very good book, and it's very convincing in terms of the argument, in terms of the data. But the reason that it's so successful is the first time that articulates in a convincing way, but it's not a pamphlet, 577 pages, uh, because the consciousness of the American people in the last three years has been shaken by this constant repetition by the Occupy movement and then the images in television and then the debates, etc., etc. So that's how the transformation of, of history operates. Uh, then, institutional change. Well, in Iceland, you know better than me, the whole process of transformation, even if later on the betrayal of social democrats to their promises led to the right going back. Uh, but originally, the social democrats could have been in power for a long, long time if they had uh, supported what they said they would. Uh, the Arab revolutions tra have transformed the Arab world with different outcomes and in some cases, as I said, human tragedies. But as for impact, there has been an impact. The, the, the Arab world has been transformed forever by these spontaneous and organized useless social movements. Um, even you, you, you always need a, a, a historical perspective. Iran, remember July 2009. I know somewhat Iran. I, I, I was there uh, uh, in 2005, 2006. Um, 
And I saw a very vibrant society with a very strong democratic current in the, in the Islamists, uh, led by Hatami at that point. Uh, well, uh, I, gave a, 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 I was giving a talk on these matters in, in London in two, July 2009 when the Iranian movement uh, took place, and the, the journalists were telling me, well, you see, yeah, internet, mobilization, mobile communication, but they are killed, they are repressed, they are in jail, and nothing. So, well, maybe, maybe not. Well, sur surprise, surprise, last fall, suddenly Rouhani is elected against all, uh, against all um, uh, prognosis. Rouhani is elected. Rouhani, Rouhani is Hatami in, to some extent. And they were the, 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 the youth of the Iranian cities who created the difference in terms of the vote to uh, throw out uh, the fundamentalists of Ahmadinejad. Yeah, it's still in the Ayatollah regime, etc. but little nuances, little nuances is that they are going to close the nuclear program, cancel one of the major crises. So you see the seeds of something filtered down into having some major effects. Um, on the other hand, things don't necessarily work on that. Turkey, uh, Erdogan uh, legitimacy was shaken, completely shaken by the movement. The majority of the Turkish public opinion support the movement. They want something like the Gezi Park is not going to be destroyed. Uh, the municipal governments are much more sensitive. However, in the last municipal elections, a uh, couple of months ago, uh, Erdogan won in, in, in all the main cities in Turkey. So you see, it's not, not an, automate, an automatic response from one uh, to another, but they, they are always uh, seen. Um, many specific demands throughout many countries in the world have been uh, accomplished. This I will not go into the detail, but we can discuss country by country. But then, the political impact, that's what most people say, well, okay, but politically what? Well, politically it really depends. Depends on the openness of the political elites and the institutional system. Um, by and large, in the United States and in most European countries, the political elites refuse at all the existence of the movement. Why? Because they challenge, the, these movements challenge their own existence. If they say, you do not represent us, what they are going to say, oh, nice, uh, we agree with you. Uh, that would require a historical vision that something has to be changed uh, that could affect their own power. No one is doing that in Europe. No one. Absolutely no one. Um, and, and then what happens then is the filtering down of these pressures toward all kind of other anti-system expressions, right and left, or in between, or let's say above both. Um, Italy, uh, the, I'm not... Uh, a partisan of Beppe Grillo or anything like this for a number of reasons, but personally, but analytically, a party that did not exist, suddenly in the last parliamentary elections in Italy, in fe last February, February 2013, became number one party in Italy. 26.2% uh, of the vote uh, didn't go into government because then there was an alliance between Berlusconi and the ex-communists who had campaigned uh, to oust Berlusconi out of the politics and then as soon as they came into power, they needed Berlusconi to have a front against uh, the, the, the party that uh, represents some form of alternative. Now, but that's a very crazy party. Uh, it's a party that among other things in the program is to cancel the Italian parliament and replace it by local assemblies and internet elections and internet deliberation. Hmm, crazy, right? Well, uh, largest non party in terms of the number of votes in Italy. So that's a symptom. I'm not saying it's the solution. I'm saying it's a symptom, but a very powerful symptom. And it, at this point in the poll for the European Parliament election is the second largest party in Italy in terms of sending uh, to uh, deputies to the European Parliament, deputies with the program of dissolving the European Parliament. Interesting, huh? But it's the same thing in, in a different way in the UK IP. And it's the same thing in the National Front in France. And it's the same thing in several of the parties you know very well in the right-wing xenophobic Scandinavian parties. Um, so I'm not saying, 
and therefore a new revolutionary left is emerging. No, I'm saying the institutional system as it is, is being exhausted. In the case of Spain for the European Parliament, in terms of the direct intention of vote, the two major parties, the Conservative Party uh, and the Spanish Party, two, and the Socialist Party, together, together have 26% of the vote. 14 for the Conservatives, 12 for the Socialists. But because of the electoral law, etc., they are going to have the majority of deputies for the European Parliament. That cognitive dissonance between what people think and the political system cannot go on for a long time. So the first stage of the transformation of the political system has already taken place. The full delegitimation of the existing forces. The second stage, meaning the reconstruction of the political system, inventing new forms of representation and democracy, is still in process or it may never happen. But the one thing we know is that the social movement that I have tried to analyze for you are the levers of social change in our world. As for the results of this social change, history and you and me will say. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I guess we have some time for a few questions, and um, we have to uh, to bring uh, uh, the mic around. Uh, but please give me a hand. Uh, thank you. My name is Masid Rahman. I am working at this university. I am a sociologist. I've been working with Network for many years, and. With great interest, I have been listening to your fascinating lecture on such an interesting and very current affair. Well, comparing all the world. <laughs> so, anyway, it was really interesting. So, I think, am I allowed to ask uh, one or two questions? Or the authority two, will determine. Two, it's, uh, okay. yeah. Because so many things are there and so many questions are there. Uh, so. I feel tempted to ask so when you are here. Anyway, I will limit my question and there were only two questions. The first of I think maybe I start with what you are talking about. The most important thing about the social movement is about the notion of emotion. Well, I think and you also think uh, that uh, this, what I understood emotion, that means how the social movements manage to shape the minds of the people, how they think, and in that, to the, with, with this aim, I think what they do, as you mentioned here in the lecture, they occupy public space and also the cyber space. And both these spaces are autonomy, autonomous. Now, my question is about here, yeah, what we experience, I am also very much aware of that because you are not really interested in the consequence, but I think hardly we can avoid the consequence of the movement. Is the movement only just for movement? The people always have something in their mind to achieve something. Definitely they want to change institutions. First of all, during the movement, it happens that not only the initiator, they really can manipulate or they can shape the mind. This autonomy may be intimidated. There can be, when is the movement, there can be counter movement as we have seen in the case of Egypt and also many other places. And then again, because through this using cyberspace or internet or social media, the propaganda is everywhere. And that also comes in some sort of threats and autonomy is being intimidated. And afterwards we have seen that in what happened in Egypt that using this or misusing or abusing social media, undemocratic forces have captured the fruit of the uh, movement, who again, in fact, occupying power, what they achieve, in fact, either making 
democracy dysfunctional or establish some dysfunctional democracy. Those forces have been again removed in a very non-democratic manner. How will I address this? Is it still a arrow spring? Second question is about <laughs> Can we go one, yeah. one by one? Uh, uh, I, think, I think we take, take, take one no, no, the first uh, one. Yeah. No, no, I can take two if you decide <laughs> yeah. to take two, but uh, <laughs> one by one is better in terms of the discussion, no? Okay, I will make this question very short because... Uh, because he, he, he will try to answer the first one, please. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, uh, look, the... Um, there, is, there are people, people, individuals, uh, with their own ideas, their own mind, their own ideologies, their own beliefs, and there is the movement. And the movement is a network of interaction between different people with different purposes and different objectives. And uh, it's a synergistic relationship in which what actually happens in practice does not depend on the addition of what happened, but on the interaction within the movement and between the movement and its adversaries. So this is the general, the general thing. Now, concretely in the case of Egypt, which I want to do, um, what really happened is that in the first phase of the movement was a unified um, target that was Mubarak and was the notion of reconstructed democracy. Uh, like that, reconstructed democracy. And everybody agreed on that. And religious and non-religious uh, in, in, in the same movement. Everybody agreed on that. And even if the non-religious no, knew that if a free election would be held, the Muslim Brotherhood will win. Because m Muslim parties, Islamist parties, have won all the free elections in the Arab and Muslim world in the last years, every time the elections are free. So that's clear. But even that, the principle of should be democracy was accepted by everybody, including that. So, first phase, they blow up in, in two months the dictatorship that they could not have been uh, uh, overthrowing in 40 years. So, that's the important moment. Uh, second, then the military come in. And, in fact, they repress everybody and try to say, we will be the, the, the leaders of the new legitimacy. And they kill more people in, in 2011 than than um, Mubarak in, in, during that revolt. Well, ultimately, they force, the movement forces the military to an election. And then they accept the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood wins, and as you know very well, um, Morsi then uh, betrays his electoral promise of not trying to establish an Islamist government and a theocratic one, and goes into that direction. And then the movement mobilizes again against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood this time, and then, of course, the army takes advantage of that, but the movement created the condition under which the, the Islamist uh, government could not go on. So as soon as the Muslim Brotherhood is uh, defeated, then the army again tries now to legitimize a new military dictatorship under the formal constitution, and what the movement is doing, fighting now the, uh, the army at this point in the streets of Egypt. So the process is relentless, uh, no systematic outcome has been achieved, but what is clearly has been achieved is that the movement has the most powerful voice and not just the army in Egyptian politics. That's what I was trying to, to exemplify. Okay, do we have another question? Yeah, Odin, please give him the mic. Yes, thank you very much for an inspiring lecture. I have only one question sure. about Ludwig Holberg. And uh, let me wind back to the end of the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the Balkan War, where the UNESCO tried to establish a program called MUST. Alan Terrain was involved. And uh, it was called Management of Social Transformation. And it was, I think, a flop. So I take, interpret your lecture that the management of social transformation is an impossibility. Sure. It's all spontaneous, and uh, social scientists can only be spectators and see what is happening. We cannot predict anything. And that brings me to Ludwig Holberg, who brought enlightenment to Norway, and we are celebrating a constitution today of 200 years, an enlightenment constitution like the American ones, that allows everybody to fend for himself, 
and to defend himself and to carry a gun if necessary in the US. We can go to the European Court of Human Rights if we are mistreated by the national courts. But he brought what we call the natural rights, uh, Lex Naturalis. That was his main program, uh, Holberg. And some of our law on sovereignty of the state and so on and the king was based on the Lex Naturalis. That was later combated by what we call uh, positive law, that human-made laws can change the minds of people. And uh, in a way, when you say that dignity is the fundamental force in social development, do you agree with Ludwig Holberg that there are some laws that are above human-made laws that stands forever. Don't mess with human dignity. Is that the gospel? <laughs> That's a great point. Not a question, but a great statement. Um, yeah, thinking aloud, the, um, there is, if we, by law, we understand either laws of society. I think we can say with confidence that there are no laws of society. Uh, as, uh, laws of nature are based on uncertainty as well. But laws of society, the notion that by definition things will happen in a particular way, uh, at least we have not discovered. And we have not discovered because of the incredible complexity of the interaction of trillions of neuron connections in billions of humans. And, and therefore, it, the, the level of complexity, not with the greatest mathematical theory and with a huge big data, now big data is the word, uh, we, we, we could actually reach that. Um, what, and one of the, in fact, one example of this is that some economists think there are laws that govern economic behavior, and we see again and again and again that they think so, but the economy thinks otherwise. Um, so, the, what I, I would say, they are not laws, but there are some basic principles that emerge from the human consciousness that they have, over time, um, proven more resilient than the institutions themselves, uh, which, which is the notion that we have some commonality, and this commonality is to be humans, and what it means to be human to be recognized rights as human. And in that sense, the notion of dignity, and I'm not a historian, but I would love that some historians go back in history and try to trace back how this feeling of humiliation uh, was critical for the reconstruction of society on the basis of other institutions that would start with the respect of human rights. And that goes for politics, but it goes for women, and I would now extend to the most interesting social movement that is going on uh, these days, uh, animal rights. You know, uh, part of the human rights is our right to recognize the, our interaction and commonality with animals as human beings, uh, sorry, as beings, which are not human, but they are beings, and therefore <laughs> we, we live in interaction with them all the time. So this notion which you can take it dignity, or you can take it human rights, or you can take it living being rights. Uh, I think this is common to many societies, and many of these movements inspire themselves in this uh, millennial tradition about defending your right to be yourself. Thank you. I think there is another question, and if there is some more, there is one there, lady in the green. Um, hi, thank you. Um, very interesting lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, I have been a student here of ecological economics, and I have a, a, a brief question to you. You talk about cognitive dissonance and how people are not really relating to the institutions and political systems and economy as well. I was wondering if you have an advice or a comment to an institution like this university and other universities as well, uh, in terms of how we should teach economic theory and economic thinking and, and in what direction uh, we should go. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I would simply say, as I say uh, everywhere and to everybody, 
be aware of the diversity of economic theories and the diversity of economic perspectives because uh, at least in the United States now has become clear that the large majority of economic departments uh, either you are neoclassical and mathematical or you are not an economist. And this is simply wrong uh, in terms of knowledge because uh, the, the key element for knowledge advancement is to pay attention to the diversity of the intellectual perspectives. Um, and again, if I take the example, because it's a fashionable example of uh, uh, Piketty's book, which is a, he is a very solid mathematical economist himself, but he's not uh, starting with the fundamentals of the market. He's starting from a different perspective, uh, with the kind of economy that economy as if people matters, which is a, a, a new economic uh, thought uh, school. So it's not, the, the, what I would say is not one against the other, but to teach students the diversity of perspectives so that the students themselves can actually elaborate their own uh, approach to economics, I think is, is quite fundamental. Okay, I think we have to stop there. I, I see some hands, but I think we have to stop because there is a PhD seminar uh, in 10 minutes. So then I just want to say thank you to uh, Sigmund Grönmo and uh, the, Nobel, Nobel, the Holberg Peace Prize uh, uh, Secretariat to, to, be, uh, uh, to include us in this, uh, in this lecture of, of, uh, of uh, earlier uh, winners. And of course, I want to say thank you to Manuel Costels. Uh, thank you for coming here. And I could say that I have the book uh, in my office. I will try to read it as soon as possible, and then I will give it to the library. <laughs> <laughs> and as a memory for being in Buddha, I will give you, thank you. A, a, a small gift. And you can have this back in your office, or either in, uh, in uh, Los Angeles, or Definitely. when you come to your Barcelona. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>